During the 11th century, the Byzantine Empire was more or less at its zenith, the height of culture. But there was one place in the world that had still yet to be touched by man, a land of prehistoric beasts and in the 1250s would become home to Tangata Whenua, the people of the land, Māori. Kia ora and good day. My name is Thomas, the fella behind the History of Aotearoa New Zealand podcast. Having listened to Robin for a couple of years now, he inspired and helped me to start my own podcast about my small island nation. If you're an avid listener of the history of Byzantium, you will feel right at home. We are a narrative podcast going from before the arrival of humans and going into the 20th century. At the moment, we are talking about the various aspects of pre-European Māori culture. Things like social structure, carving, tattooing, religion, food and war, including the haka. Te reo Māori, the Māori language, is a large component of the show, so you'll learn some key words like mana, tapu, rangatiratanga, fano, and many others. We also do dramatic retellings of Māori myths and legends inspired by Robin's fantastic House of War episode. Although the stories of Constantinople and Aotearoa never really intersect until the Gallipoli landings of World War I, I hope you'll join us to learn something new and exciting about the land of the long white cloud. You can find us on most podcast services, Facebook, Twitter, and historyaotearoa.com. Aotearoa spelled A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. Until then, get your taringas, ears, ready for some history of Byzantium. Haritu watu, hokitu mai. Go well, and return in good health. Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 190, The End of the Macedonian Dynasty. Last time, we brought Act 2 of this century of narrative to a close with the death of Constantine the Ninth. Monomachos. Act one of our century saw a parade of unlikely emperors come and go, with no serious consequences for the empire. The strong position that Basil II had left the state in meant that a few incompetent or inexperienced rulers wouldn't ruin the whole enterprise. That theory was pushed to its limits by Act two and the reign of Monomachos. An easy-going and pleasant man, Monomachos was not at all prepared for a series of events which would push the empire into a serious crisis within the space of a decade. In Italy, the Normans slipped into the bloodstream, while in East and West, tribes of steppe nomads made their homes in and around Byzantium's borders. The Romans had enough trouble dealing with one enemy at a time. Three was beyond their capabilities. Italy was abandoned, while much blood and treasure sank into the Balkan mud as an uneasy peace was concluded with the Pechenegs. This rapid escalation of the empire's military budget put Monomachos in a corner, and his decision to debase the coinage saved him politically, but condemned his successors. Monomachos' decision was predicated on a future period of peace when the currency could be restored, but the Turkic tribesmen eyeing Anatolia's vast plains had no intention of gifting the empire any respite. That is not yet apparent to the Romans. They are aware of the potential threat of Seljuk forces, but don't fully understand that the independent tribesmen have no interest in their sultan's peace treaties. Act three of our century will see a trickle become a flood as Turkic war bands begin to penetrate further into Roman territory. The conclusion of this narrative arc will see Emperor come face to face with Sultan at Manzikert. Monomachos apparently had his eye on the governor of Bulgaria to succeed him presumably just the sort of military-minded practical leader that the empire required. But instead, Theodora, Basil II's niece, raced to the palace to secure her own position and with it the chance to rule the empire alone. Regardless of Theodora's individual merits, this was bad news for Byzantium. Not only did it continue the streak of leaders with no military experience, 
but it further delayed the transition away from the moribund Macedonian dynasty towards something new. Or to put it another way, no one was pondering what kind of reign the 70-plus-year-old Theodora was going to have. Everyone was just thinking, I wonder who will succeed her, and what will that mean for me? Theodora was already the reigning empress, of course. No coup was needed to put her on the throne. I suspect that Monomachos was hoping she would die quietly before he did, but alas, she survived, and his attempts to sideline her failed. To her credit, she refused to hand out the usual round of donatives and promotions that marked a new accession. The empire's finances were under severe strain, and she wasn't going to add to their burdens. The population of the capital were content with this. Theodora had been their princess for seven decades, but out in the provinces the military office holders were becoming twitchy. That spring, 1055, Nicephorus Vrienios, one of the commanders during the Pechneg Wars, led his forces from their barracks in eastern Anatolia to Chrysopolis on the Bosphorus. He was eventually arrested and exiled, and his troops returned home. He hadn't made a concerted attempt to start a civil war. Presumably, he'd hoped that the aging empress might adopt him as her successor, but she did not. His actions were a warning of things to come. Also scurrying back to Constantinople was our historian Michael Pselos. Having fled the capital to become a monk during the last days of Monomachos, he now hastily returned. Pselos loved the life of the court, and thanks to his intellectual gifts, he was welcomed into Theodora's administration. News arrived that summer that the Seljuk sultan Tugrul Beg, or Turul Bey, had entered Baghdad. Theodora sent an embassy to ensure that the two sides would remain at peace, but as I hinted earlier, this made little difference to the Turkic tribesmen now living on the other side of the Armenian mountains. That same summer, they raided into Roman territory and killed the governor of Tehran when he met them in battle. The Fatimids also attacked the empire that year. The Seljuks and Fatimids were bitterly opposed and about to come to blows in Baghdad itself as well as across Syria. The Byzantine decision to acknowledge Seljuk claims to authority over the Islamic world gave Cairo the pretext for another assault on Roman territory. Fatimid forces seized the city of Laodicea and the coastline heading up towards Antioch. The following year, the Roman fleet was pressed into service and the Egyptian troops were driven from the area. Theodora's reign did not last much beyond that. During August 1056, she began to suffer serious intestinal pains, and her eunuchs began to search for her replacement. The man they brought forward was Michael Bringas, or Vringas, a civil servant who had worked for many years in the Department of Military Finance but it wasn't his financial expertise that recommended Michael to Theodora's advisers. It was that he was a career bureaucrat in his 60s with no children. Michael was yet another non-entity, compromise candidate who wouldn't rock the boat. Theodora gave her consent before dying on August 31st, after ruling alone for a year and a half. So ends the glorious Macedonian dynasty, begun by Basil I back in the 860s. This extraordinary line of emperors and empresses had taken Byzantium from beaten down backwater to dominant Clare in the eastern Mediterranean. It had required an extraordinary amount of effort from the individuals involved to stay in power and several of their number are amongst the most competent rulers the empire ever had. 
It's worth noting, though, that the dynasty enjoyed some vital cameos from outsiders like Romanos Lecabinos and Nicephorus Phocas, and it would be misleading, if uncharitable, not to point out that their two centuries of glory coincide neatly with the collapse of the Abbasid Caliphate and the rise of the Seljuk state. I've already told you pretty much all we know about the new emperor, Michael VI. Although the Vringas family were a well-established one at Constantinople, two generations before, it was a Joseph Vringas who was put in charge of the defence of the city when Nicephorus Phocas appeared across the waters demanding to be elevated. There is some irony in what is about to happen to his descendant, Michael. Also, you might be amused to know that Michael was known in some circles as Michael the Younger, to distinguish him from long-deceased family members. Now, in his 60s, the crowd's mocking nickname for him was The Old Man. Sadly for The Old Man, the death of Theodora broke the spell of Macedonian legitimacy which had held the last few creaking regimes together. The loyalty that men felt they owed Basil's niece did not extend to the civil official who had replaced her. That very day, according to one source, a rival claimant to the throne tried to unseat the new emperor. This was Theodosius Monomachos, cousin of the former emperor who had died 18 months previously. Theodosius was one of those who had been dreaming during Theodora's reign that perhaps he would be next in line for the top job. When he heard that this was not the case, he gathered his friends and family together and headed for the streets. He tried to stir up a popular protest in his favour following the time-honoured traditions of these occasions. His supporters made a lot of noise as they processed down the messy. Theodosius shouted to onlookers, explaining who he was and why he deserved their support. And a crowd did begin to form and helped him break into the praetorium, the city's prison, so that he could free those inside. But the people did not really know Theodosius. He didn't have a significant public profile, and many of those following him were simply after a free lunch. When he reached the Hagia Sophia, he found the doors locked to him. News then arrived that the palace guards were arming themselves to disperse the crowds. They were not needed. Monomachos's support melted away, including the rest of his friends and relations. He was left alone with just his son, sitting on the steps outside the church, awaiting his fate. The unforgiving crowds would remember him as Monomachos the Moron. Despite the comedy of this failed coup, Michael knew that he had the thinnest of thin claims to legitimacy and he needed to butter up the elites quickly if he was going to survive. So he doled out a generous round of promotions and perks to the capital's civil grandees. Strangely, though, he did not do the same for the empire's military officers. Michael had spent his career in the Department of Military Finance, and he knew that even with the debased coinage, the Empire couldn't afford to increase the salaries or dignities of any generals. But he didn't find a convincing way to explain this to the military establishment. First to be offended was Vrienios, the man who Theodora had exiled. Michael sent him back to his post, but refused to restore his confiscated property alienating a known insubordinate, as Antony Caldellus puts it. Then the emperor managed to drive away one of his most important mercenary commanders, Hervé Frankopoulos. Hervé was a Norman knight who had been recruited by George Maniakis during the invasion of Sicily. Hervé liked life in Byzantium, where he was paid handsomely to lead his fellow Westerners in imperial campaigns. Now, having seen his pay cut by the debasement and refused a promotion by the new emperor, he went AWOL. He took 300 of his troops east into the mountains and offered to join one of the Turkish bands that was raiding the countryside. 
to see Western knights and Turkish step riders both ravaging the Byzantine countryside was a harbinger of dark things to come. But the immediate consequences were not severe. The Turks and Normans fell out, and Hervé was arrested by the Marwanids. We will be hearing from him again. Michael then provoked his own downfall during Easter 1057. Unhappy with the new regime, a group of senior officers approached the emperor to find a way through the impasse. It's hard to understand how Michael could be so foolish, but according to all the histories, he was rude and short with the generals. He wouldn't discuss further promotions and even criticise their recent performance against the Fatimids. This collection of officers were the sons of Basil II's generals. Their names are the names of emperors and generals past and future. Komnenos, Kikafmenos, Vortsis, Thukas, Ahiros, Skleros. They wanted pay and promotions, yes, but they were also worried about the debased coinage and its effects on morale. With the Vasilevs refusing to hear them out, they met secretly to plot his downfall. Between them, it was agreed that Isaac Komnenos was the most qualified, and he would be their candidate for the throne. Each headed back to his command post in Anatolia to gather men for the coming conflict. Headstrong as usual, Vrienios nearly blew the whole project by acting too quickly. He began handing out bribes as soon as he reached the Anatolikon and was arrested and blinded by another officer who was not in on the plan. The rest of the rebels gathered what forces they could and headed for Komnenos' home in Paphlagonia where they acclaimed him emperor in early June. I've often wondered how rebel armies form in situations like these. After all, no one really knew anything about the new emperor. So why would, say, a foot soldier from Cappadocia want to risk his life to overthrow someone who he was barely aware of? The answer, of course, is that the common soldiers rarely had a say in such matters, and we get an insight into how the rebels co-opted the armies from this story. One of the rebel commanders, Kekav Menos, forged letters from the government ordering men to muster to fight the Turks. Once he had them gathered, he lined them up for an inspection. His retinue then marched along the line, asking individual unit commanders to come forward, away from their men, for a chat. Only then were they informed of the real reason that they had been called up. So imagine that you are a small-time officer living on your farm in the provinces, you serve as a soldier to make extra cash, but have no interest in taking part in a civil war. You've now walked away from the protection of your unit, and the wealthy general from down the road has his arm around you. His retainers stand nearby, grim-faced, hands on hilts, as the general explains that we're not going east, we're going west. And it's your job to convince your men to serve the rebellion well. If you don't like this idea, then we can relieve you of your command right now but will also be relieving you of your life. The junior officers were all suborned in this way and made to swear oaths of loyalty to Isaac on the spot. Then they walked awkwardly back to their unit to explain the situation and off the general marched to the next unit in the line. When news of the rebellion reached Constantinople, Michael immediately called all his Balkan troops to the capital to defend him. He showered them with the promotions and bonuses he'd refused to release before and sailed them over to Anatolia. The Loyalist army gathered at Nicomedia while the rebels took nearby Nicaea. A few weeks later, the two sides lined up on a plain somewhere between the two cities and fought a very bloody battle. In the end, Isaac Komnenos emerged victorious with the loyalist armies dispersing. Many of those who died that day were experienced Roman troops who would be badly missed during the next twenty years. This is a persistent theme throughout Roman history. Whenever the empire is in crisis, 
civil war emerges to further weaken the vitality of the state. News of this victory doomed Michael VI. There was no way he could continue on as sole ruler of the empire. But perhaps he could make some kind of deal with Isaac and preserve his head. To achieve this, he turned to Michael Pselos, who he asked to lead an embassy to the rebel camp. Up to this point, our historian had been a court intellectual rather than actually taking part in events. This was his chance to take centre stage. In his chronographia, the meeting between himself and Komnenos is the climax of the piece. During their discussions, Pselos overwhelms the would-be emperor with the skill of his rhetoric, convincing him to be adopted by Michael, ensuring he would succeed one day, but preserving Vringas on the throne. It's hard to trust a story that so colourfully praises its own author, and interestingly, one of our other sources alleges the opposite, that Komnenos wasn't interested in compromise and that Pselos sold his master out, revealing Vringas's weakness to the rebels and ingratiating himself with what he could see would soon be the new regime. The truth doesn't matter too much for our narrative. Back at the capital, the people got wind of what was going on and began to agitate against the emperor. According to one source, Vringas had forced many people to swear oaths that they would never accept Komnenos as their sovereign. Now it emerged that he was negotiating with the rebel, people called him out for his hypocrisy. If he becomes your heir, then we will have to break the oaths that you made us swear. There are also conflicting reports about the role of the patriarch in all this. You remember Michael Kirularios, he of the Great Schism. Kirularios had once been part of a coup plot himself, and one source claims that he was actively fermenting dissent in order to play kingmaker. In the end, he did play un-kingmaker. As the crowds chanted for his head, Michael realised it was time to go. He didn't want more blood spilt for a losing cause. Representatives from Kirularios came to the palace, and he asked them, If I abdicate, what will the patriarch give me in exchange for my kingdom? And they replied, The kingdom of heaven. Vringas bent his head to be tonsured and went quietly into his monastic exile. It was late August 1057, and he'd ruled the empire for almost exactly one year. Antony called Ellis's argument about this period, between Basil II's death and the Battle of Manzikert, is that there was no imperial decline, as so many history books label it, simply the return of all the other elements of the political sphere that had been bottled up during Basil's long reign. We've already seen empresses picking their favourites to rule, and the crowds overthrowing Michael V. Now we get the rest of the political sphere tumbling through the door, eunuchs choosing a cipher to rule through, a successful military rebellion, and the patriarch getting involved to increase his own influence. It is the destabilising effects of this return to multipolarity which makes the empire ill-equipped to deal with the new challenges assailing it on multiple fronts. To emphasise his point that we've seen this all before, Professor Caldellis draws a nice comparison between Vringus's fall and the elevation of Nicephorus' focus back in 963. That was about a century ago, and yet the events were very similar. Phocas had the backing of the Eastern military establishment and arrived unopposed at the capital. Inside the city, the crowds began to support his candidacy, and on both occasions, ironically, it was a member of the Vringas family who had to make way for a general to become emperor. Whether this was a natural function of Byzantine political life or not, none of this conflict was what the empire needed at this moment. What Byzantium needed was a military-minded, competent ruler who, 
well, I guess they now have one. Next time, Isaac Komnenos becomes Emperor of the Romans. Finally, a sensible, experienced military man is on the throne. Will he prioritise the frontiers and the fiscal crisis? Yes, absolutely. Will he succeed? Well, let's find out together. Thank you so much for listening. For anyone who'd like to know more about the history of the Maori and New Zealand, then check out Thomas's excellent podcast. Go wherever you get your shows from and look for the history of Aotearoa New Zealand or visit historyaotearoa.com. <laughs>